Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi and welcome back to those who are joining after Ramadan who weren't there in Ramadan. Um, before we start in earnest, um, I'd like to mention for those who weren't here in Ramadan, we basically concluded most of Hajj in the course of Ramadan. We just have a short, a small amount of Hajj left. And I suggest those who weren't here in Ramadan can go back over those last three short classes that we did to uh, to find out exactly if they need to know about Hajj, exactly what a person does. Obviously, Hajj is not too far away now. Within about six weeks, people will probably be heading towards the Hajj. So it's probably a useful time for people to go over that again. I'm not going to go over it again because we went over it in those three classes. So if people want to go back over that, they are welcome to do so. But we are still in the section of Hajj. So I will continue from where we left off. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم سبحانك اللهم لا إلم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم So for those who have the books in front of them of the Ibn Ashir we're right near the end of the section of Hajj where he talks about Ihram so we're right near the end of the section where he talks about Ihram and he says ومانع الإحرام صيد البر so that's the line that we reached. He, ihram, being in ihram, makes killing or hunting land animals forbidden. Um, and if somebody kills them, fi qatlihi, there is what's called jaza. There is this thing which is called jaza. La, not when it is something like a mouse. So that's the line we reach. Before we go into that. He's basically now going into the section that talks about what being in ihram makes haram for you. When you are in ihram, what are you allowed to do? What are you not allowed to do? We talked a little bit about this at the beginning of the section of Hajj. But there's two things that sometimes get confused. And that's a person being a muhrim, being in ihram, and being within the haram, which is the area around Mecca, which stretches from Tan'im in the north, which is the one of the closest places to, or pretty much the closest place, the closest edge of the Haram to the Kaaba. It's about four and a half miles north. Um, Ji'arana in the northeast, which is about 13 and a half miles going towards the northeast. It's a slightly strange shape, the Haram. Um, this, the Haram, by the way, was known about in the early times before Islam. They had they, the Haram was designated, and Sayyidina Umar was the person who re-put down the markers, which had been knocked down by the by, by the idolaters at various times. And he went and he got some of the old huntsmen and people who knew about these things. And they went with him and showed him the places where they were and he put them back up again. So the, the haram was put black back, just as the, by the way, the, um, the, the maqam of Ibrahim السلام, was also put back in place in the time of Sayyidina Umar, um, because it had been pushed close to the Kaaba um, before then to protect it from being washed away by the floods. There was a time when they were going through a lot of floods and the Maqam of Ibrahim was was not set firmly in the ground. So it was it was it was washed away or every time it was in danger of being lost. So um, it was pushed close to the Kaaba. So Sayyidina that there, there was strings that, that some of the people of knowledge had made to measure out exactly how far it was from the Kaaba. And then he made sure that it was put back in place. And then he put it, he set it in place so that it couldn't be washed away. So a lot of these things were done in the time of Sidna Umar. And you have to realize that in the time of Sidna Abu Bakr, the Ummah was mostly engaged in fighting the wars of the Ridda. And in the time of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they conquered Mecca very late in the, in, in, in the lifetime of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So a lot of these things were done in the time of Sidna Umar. So it's Tan'im in the north, which is about four and a half miles north. Ja'arana in the northeast, going, going in that direction, about 13 and a half miles. The edge of Arafah. So when you're on Hajj, you go to Arafah. The actual plains of Arafah are outside of the Haram. The edge of Arafah is where the edge of the Haram is. And then in the, in the, that's, that's southeast of Mecca. Then you have in the south, Adliban, which is about 10 miles away. And then Hudaybiyah, which is very famous for the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which is in the direction towards Medina, which is towards the west, about 13 and a half miles. And that basically was, was the Haram. Within the Haram, you're also not allowed to kill game. 
And certain other things are prohibited when you are in the haram. So there's being a muhrim and there's being in the haram. And the same sorts of prohibitions apply to that location as applied to the person who's in that state. So you can be somebody who's not doing hajj, but it's still impermissible for you to hunt on the edges of the haram. And if you do, you will have to do sacrifices and various other things, or the, the, what's called the jazah here. So he says here, being in ihram, and also being in the haram in this case, makes it prohibited for you to hunt game. By game, we mean land animals, of things like antelope, and even um, certain types of animals that, that will pose a danger to you if they are not in the process of posing a danger to you, such as lions and hyenas and things like that. If they are not actually posing any danger to you, then you have no reason to set traps for them and hunt them. So you can't do that while you are in ihram. If you hunt one of these animals, you can either capture it or kill it. If you capture it and then let it go, you're okay. If you capture it and let somebody else slaughter it, you are culpable if you give it over to them. So both the person who slaughtered it and, and you, if you are both in ihram, will have to pay jaza. So what exactly is jaza? Jaza is is literally the, the restitution or the payment that you have to do for this. So what happens when you kill an, an animal, say an antelope, is you go between two in front of two judges. And these judges are people who have knowledge about these sorts of things. And you basically tell them what type of jaza you want to do, and then they make a ruling on how much that jaza is going to be. So either the jaza is giving an animal, that is, this is all this is described in the Quran, either you give you have to slaughter an animal that is of a similar size to the one that you killed. So if you kill, killed an antelope, for example, it might be a sheep. If you killed a giraffe, it would be a camel, for example. Either you kill an animal which is of like size, or you find out how much that animal is worth in terms of grain, rather than going to money first. How much grain would you exchange for an animal of that, of that sort that you killed? And then when you've worked out how much that grain is, then you have to give two muds to every poor person of the area where you are, where you, where you, where you, where you killed the game. And, um, or you can choose to fast. You have to fast one day for every two muds grain worth of the animal. So you can choose which, and then the two judges decide how much it's actually going to be. Is that understood? So that's basically just that. Jaza is, is for most of the game animals that you kill. Um, if it's a small thing, like you kill um, a small animal that's below the level of even being worth that much food, then you might have to give a handful of food. So say you kill a, a louse, the minimum you're going to give is a handful. A louse or something like that, even though that's not a game. If you kill something like that, you have to, you have to give a certain amount of jaza for it. So the things that the animals you don't have to pay jaza for, he says, kalfari, like a mouse or a rat or something of that nature. The animals that are basically pests. But uh, yeah, wouldn't allow pests. Yeah, but those those are not counted. The sorts of ones that are that are that, that come onto your body as a result of you not washing are are part of the harm that the going into ihram brings on brings on a person as as a result of the other prohibitions of not not combing your hair and not washing yourself thoroughly and so on that's that's part of the state of being in ihram that you put up with those ta that type of harm so things like fleas and lice and things like that that come onto the human body as a result of being in such a situation but things that are extant are from you the things that are just basically harmful creatures that don't really that basically annoy and attack human beings and cause them strife, rats and stuff like that. You can kill them to avoid them calling you, causing you, causing causing you harm. Or even sometimes when they don't, they're not causing you harm when they are that, that type of creature. So he, he mentions the rat. Then he mentions akrab scorpions. Um, then he mentions hida, which is trans, often translated as kites, but it's those types of of. Um, Predatory birds that sometimes when they're hungry might attack a person or a baby or whatever, you know, those types of, you know, predatory uh, birds of prey. Yes. Yeah, not all birds of prey, but 
things which are very aggressive types of birds of prey. Um, then kalbun akhur, um, rapacious or wild, wildish dogs, basic you know, dogs when they have become a bit wild and are likely to start attacking people, basically. I mean, obviously not ones that are just cuddly and they don't do anything to people, but if they are a little bit hungry and they're likely to attack in packs, dogs you'll often find in packs and they can be a bit dangerous if you're on your own. Um, when they when they become wild, obviously there's another thing that you can kill. Hayya snakes, especially poisonous ones, obviously. Ma'al hurab idiyajur, and so and and also ravens or crows when they are when they are attacking, when they when they are when they when they when they attack people. Again, you know that type of bird sometimes can can go into packs and be very aggressive and attacking. So those are the, those ones. If you kill them, you don't have to give jazer. There's no consequence to killing that type of creature. Obviously, there's no consequence also to killing creatures that you're allowed to kill in order to eat, sacrificing sheep and cows and stuff like that, so long as it's not part of the official sacrifice and not sacrifice outside of its place. <laughs> if it's just to eat, you're allowed to kill creatures for that purpose. <laughs> So they also say it's forbidden for, for you to wear anything which goes around a limb, whether it's tied around the limb or whether it's sewn around the limb or now whether it's, uh, it's with a, what's it called? Um, what's that? Zip. Zip. When it's zipped around the limb, however, however, however it's attached around the limb, not just folded, obviously, but actually physically tied when it goes around the limb. And he mentions an example of this will be like, a ring, a signet ring. Another example might be when you put something around your neck, like a sign to say who you are, um, or a necklace. Um, this is, applies to men, by the way, not to women. Um, uh, a hat, which goes around the head. Shoes, which go around your the back of your foot. But it doesn't apply to hajj sandals, which don't have a back to them. Um, so all of these things that have that go all around, that's why trousers and shirts and all those things, they go completely around the limb. So you're not allowed to wear them, no matter how they are attached. There is, um, maybe he comes to that, you're, there are certain things that you are allowed to wear um, that do go around for, for necessity. And one of those is called a hajj belt. It's like a belt, but you, so long as you put it under your, your, your ihram, rather than over the top, because if you put it over the top, basically you're attaching that, that is are around your body. So if it's underneath, it's okay, but not if it's over the top. And you have to only use that to carry your own stuff. Not if you're only wearing, if you're only using it for other people's stuff. So basically, if you have no stuff of your own and other people say, can you do, you know, you're a strong chap. Can you have the belt round, you know, I'm, you know, I've got skin rash, I can't wear it. Can you wear it? Can you wear it so that I, and hold my stuff for me? Then you can't do that. But if it's your own stuff, then it's acceptable. So there's another thing which is part of the ihram, and that's covering your face. You're not allowed to cover your face in ihram. Even when you're sleeping, you shouldn't be covering your face. Not deliberately. If it happens accidentally, it's a different matter. But you shouldn't deliberately, when you go to sleep, put your, for example, put your sheet over your head so that you could, so it's easier to sleep. You shouldn't be covering your face while you're in ihram. If somebody does it to you and you wake up and you find out, then you remove it. But you shouldn't be covering your face while you are in ihram or your head. This is, this is for a man. Obviously, it's a bit different for women. Women are allowed to cover their heads. But the, the face is also something which women are not allowed to cover. So he says here, وَالسَّطْرَ um, لِلْوَجْهِ Covering the face, أو الرأس, or the head, بِمَا يُعَدُّ سَاتِرًا With something which is what a person would consider a, a cover, like a piece of cloth or a paper or whatever it is, is not, so long if it's, it's put over and covered over the thing properly, is not allowed. But, but the, the female, 
is only forbidden from two things. So in terms of clothing, she is forbidden from two things, gloves, covering her hands. She's not allowed to cover her hands. Similarly, covering her face, so long as she hasn't covered it for the purpose of modesty. So what this means is covering your face to protect you from the sun or covering your face to protect you from anything or just covering it just simply because you think you have to. That's not allowed. It is allowed, though, for example, maybe a woman covers it because she is worried that she, you know, her, her, her beauty might, dist might distract people from their hajj. For example, so she covers her, she covers up out of modesty for that reason, for example. Maybe she's just very modest. But if she does it that way, it should be, it shouldn't be touching directly on the face. It should be like she has a cap on her, on her head and then has something which is draped over the front of the cap. So not wearing a burqa or a, or, or a veil. Definitely she's not allowed to wear anything that comes from below because then, then it has to be tied in order to hold it up. Yeah, it's something which comes from the top and is draped over, a bit like a curtain that covers the face if she's going to do it for the purpose of modesty. If it's not for the purpose of modesty, she's not allowed to do it. By the way, if there's any questions as we're going through, please feel free to just butt in and ask. Don't hold on ceremony. So he says also, another things that are forbidden for, for, for somebody in Ihram, is clean, perfume, touching perfume, putting perfume on your body or on your clothes. Putting perfume on your body or on your clothes, especially what's known as a female perfume. So there are different types of perfume. There are perfumes that, that have, have, have a substance to them as well as a, as well as a smell, physical substance, like, like um, you might say, for example, musk or something like that, that has a physical thing that people also attack, put, on, put on them and it leaves a deep, long lasting smell. Things like musk or oud or things of that nature. Then you have perfumes which are from flowers, usually. Things like rose and orange blossom and things like that, which are considered like male perfumes. In other words, they're not so, they're not so strong. What is prohibited is not smelling perfumes, although that is disliked. What means that you have to pay fidya is that you actually physically touch this perfume or put it on. And this is actual perfumes, I use them as perfumes, or things which are perfu perfumed. So he mentions here dahnan, which is like an ointment that you might, might put. For example, you may, in the modern world, you might put some cream, sun cream on to protect you from getting burnt. If that is perfumed, or even if it's not perfumed and you put it on without necessity, then you are, have done something wrong that requires fidya. If it is out of necessity, then, if, then, then you can put on something which is unperfumed without any consequences, like a medication, for example. Say, for example, you have a cut and you have to apply something to that cut even if the cuts on the face, maybe you have to put something which basically almost is a cover of part of your face. If it's a necessity, it's fine. So long as the thing you're putting on is unperfumed. If you're putting on the ointment or the medication and it is perfumed as well, even if it is necessary, you still have to pay fidya. But you still put it on, but you have to pay a fidya as a result. Wadarari um, Hamlin and also harming lice. Please, things of that nature, doing things which, which, which are likely to or will definitely harm them, such as, for example, putting your head into a bucket of hot, hot water when you feel itchiness on your head. Very likely that that might drown some lice or do something of that nature. That is also something that requires you to do fidya or ilqa wasah or, or, or clear, cleaning off ingrained dirt and other dirts from you. You're not meant to wash off dirt when you're in Ihram. You're meant to purify yourself, but you're not meant to try and wash yourself. Unless, of course, it's something which is, in, which, is in, which is impure, which you need to remove. For example, if you have a wet dream or something like that, then you have to wash that from your clothes and your body, obviously. But 
apart from what has to be washed off, you shouldn't be washing off dirt while you are in ihram. Zufrin sha'ar, and cutting your nails, cutting your hair, removing facial hair, anything of that nature is not allowed while you are in ihram. Wa yaftadi, you do fidya for each of the things that we have mentioned. Even if doing just a little bit of them, some of these things that we have mentioned, there is what's called a fidya. And um, that, that fidya is a sacrifice of maybe a sheep or something like that. Or you have, you have a choice basically with fidya as well. You can either do sacrifice or you can fast seven, three days in the hajj and seven when, when you get home or you can feed 10 people. So there's different choices. Sorry, feeding six people, not ten people. Six people. Um, and sacrificing what's called a nusuk, which is a livestock animal of your choice, but people will, in this case, usually opt for the easiest one, which is sheep, cheapest. min al so he says, for some of what has been mentioned from the time we mentioned Wuhit a couple of lines ago, something which covers the limbs, Lihuna up until here. So any of these things we have mentioned, from wearing clothes to putting on perfume, to killing animals, to removing harm, to cutting nails and hair, etc., all of these various things, they incur fidya. So killing game incurred jaza, which has a slightly different ruling, as we mentioned. Fidya has its own specific ruling. And then there are other, the other type of thing that you have to do in Hajj is what's called Hadi, which is for missing out elements of Hajj that are obligatory. You can set them right by doing a Hadi. In Hadi, usually the best way of a Hadi is to, is to sacrifice a camel if you're able. But it's not obligatory if you're not able to do that. in um, He says, even if a person has an excuse for doing these things, for example, the nails are causing harm because they've become really sharp. And every time he, you know, he's got, he's got a rash, every time he scratches, he's hurting himself. So he has to cut his nail to avoid himself hurting himself. But even so, he's doing something which is prohibited. So very, even, even when there is an excuse for a lot of these things, as I mentioned, not always with uh, medications. And if you have to continually put on a medication, if it's like a continuous process, you only do the once. Or if, or if you're forced to wear clothes and it's a continual process, then you only do it for the one thing of it. If it's on separate occasions, then you might have to do more than one fidya for doing these things. Each one of these things has its own fidya. So if you do each of these, you have to do a fidya for each of them, not one fidya for all of them. وَمَنَا أَن نِسَاءَ وَأَفْسَدَ الْجِمَاءَ إِلَى الْإِفَاضَةَ So being an ihram, for a man, makes it haram for him to be with women, physically. Not to obviously work next to them, but to engage in um, foreplay, for example, is, for, is forbidden. Anything that, that might lead to, to, to him ejaculating, and especially having sexual intercourse itself, which invalidates his hajj. If a person is on hajj, a man or a woman, and they engage in sexual intercourse while on the Hajj, that Hajj is invalid. They have to conceal, still continue to do the Hajj as if it wasn't invalid until it finishes, but it was invalid and they, they are obliged to come back and make it up in a future year. And if it's a man and his wife, and they slept with each other because they came on Hajj together, then if they come back again on a second year together, they should be kept apart until they finish the Hajj to avoid the possibility of that happening again. Until such time that is allowed for them, which is after if if alba. So there are there are two times when you leave Ihram. The first of those is when you've done the stoning, and you're allowed to do certain things, but you're not allowed to have sexual intercourse until you finish the last pillar of Hajj. The last pillar of Hajj is the Tawaf al-Ifadah. 
And if you're doing tamattu, which many people do now, when you go to Hajj to do Umrah, and once you've finished your Umrah, you leave your Ihram, and then you re-enter Ihram on the, 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 the eighth day with the intention of doing Hajj, the eighth of, of, of the Hijjah with the intention of doing Hajj. Um, if you're doing that, then you have to do your sa'i, your obligatory sa'i after the ifadah. Because you won't have done it on your tawaf al-qudum because that was used up in the umrah. So they, are still, they still have even more of their pillars of, of hajj left over after stoning. So you're not allowed to have sexual intercourse until you finish the tawaf al-ifadah. You baqqal imtina. So the uh, prohibition against having sexual intercourse remains until the ifadah. Kasayib. Similarly, you're not allowed to hunt animals until you have finished the ifadah. So those are the two things that remain. You are allowed after that point to wear clothes. You are allowed to put perfume on. You, you are allowed to, although it's recommended to remain in your ihram clothes until you finish the ifadah, you are allowed to now remove them when you shave your head as well and do all of these things, you're allowed to wash properly. All of those things you're allowed to do after finishing the stoning, um, which is on the day of Eid. After you've done that on the morning of Eid, you're allowed to do, leave all of those things, but that, obviously you go to the do, to do the sacrifice as well. Um, and then you do, you go the, to the, to the, to our father, but you're not allowed to have sexual intercourse or hunt game until the father is done. Then the rest of the things that uh, Ihram has made prohibited become allowed after the first stoning of Aqaba. So listen to what I have to say. Um, sometimes you go on Hajj and it's extremely hot. And the sun is beating down on you, and you're not allowed to cover your head as a as, as a man, obviously. So this can, you know, we, the, if you can't find any particular place to find shade, when you're walking around, then you are allowed to have something that you carry above you for the purpose of shade. You're on the Hajj. It just can't be attached to you. Or you're allowed to seek shade in the roof or the walls of the of of of, of the buildings and so on and so forth. But you're not allowed to have a hat on your head, like, of, you know, to protect yourself from the sun. But you are allowed to have an umbrella or a parasol or something of that nature. So, um, but you're not allowed to uh, have that in, you know, these, the, the, they used to carry, uh, so people would um, have things on the back of, on the on the back of their camels, or they would be carried by others in sort of like a, what are they called, howders or something something like that. You know where where people the things that people were carried in. You put them on the, um, yeah. There's various different names for it, but that they the, those things you're not meant to be seeking shade in that. You can she seek shade in something that you're holding to or in the walls or the roofs of buildings, but you shouldn't be going and sitting in your camel's little house on the camel or whatever it is, or those, those, those types of things. The shade that you got should be for something. In fact, most of these things, if you are able, it's better to do them walking. Not obviously the long journey is like going to Arafat and things like that, which is quite a few miles away. <laughs> Altogether, thirteen miles or so from from the Kaaba, but you know many of the other various things that you're doing, they should be done walking. Although the first the first stoning that you do, if you've come from Arafat on on a camel, for example, or however you've travelled, then you continue on in the same vein, and you stone it from your camel. You don't you don't walk in the first stoning. You do it as you come. You go straight through um, Mina without, without stopping there. Continue on your journey, however you're traveling, and then go straight to the Jamara of Aqaba and do your stoning there from however you're traveling. So that's basically the end of Hajj. Um, one of the things we didn't mention here is the Hadi, which is the sacrifice. Um, 
which is for missing out elements of the Hajj, as I said, or making doing things incorrect in the Hajj, or for example, making your Hajj invalid by having sexual intercourse, then you have to do the, the Hadi, the sacrifice the next year. And with that is the opposite of the Udhiyya. The Udhiyya is the sacrifice that we do on the Eid when we're not on Hajj. So basically in that, it's recommended to get the animal whose meat is the best. Um, so you would go with the messenger of Allah and went with the ram, because they considered the, the meat of the sheep, the ram, to be superior to the meat of cows and, and camels for eating. But with the Hajj, the opposite. It should be the one that feeds the most people. So if you do a sacrifice on the Hajj, the best form of sacrifice that you can do on the Hajj is the camel. And there are spe there's specific rulings relating to the camel. So basically, it was always recommended that you, if you can, bring this animal with you, especially if you know you're going to be doing something requiring a sacrifice. For example, you're doing tomato. You know what tomato is? One of the forms of Hajj. Yeah. So if you're doing, if you're doing tomato or Qiran, Qiran is when you combine Hajj and Umrah into the same set of actions. Tomato is when you go to, to, to Mecca to do Umrah. And then you leave Ihram and then re-enter Ihram on the days of Hajj, the eighth day, and then do the rest of the things of Hajj, and then do your Hajj. So you do Umrah first and then Hajj. Both Qiran and Tamatu require you to do a sacrifice. If you're going to be doing this, people would often bring the sacrifice with them. When they went into Ihram, they would mark the animal for sacrifice. And this was usually done by... Um, by putting something around its neck, like some sort of garland of leaves or whatever it is of something. So people, everyone who saw the animal, say the animal escaped, everyone would know that animal had been marked for sacrifice. Mm. So that this animal now has been chosen to be sacrificed. It's an offering. The, the word hadi in Arabic really means like a gift or an offering. That's the root of it. So you're basically, this animal, the moment you make it into a hadi, it's not yours anymore. It can never return to your own personal possession. This is unlike an Udhiyya, which you can change your mind about an Udhiyya and choose another animal instead of the one, say you see, you, you see a better animal that you want to sacrifice instead. Yeah, then that animal, the first, the first one you chose can stop being your Udhiyya and the next one can then be sacrificed instead. But you can't do that with Hadi. The moment you have marked an animal for sacrifice, you've given it over as an offering, that's it. Is that through intention or through physically marking? So yeah, so it's, it's, it's through intention first and foremost, but also through physically marking the animal, with, especially with camels. So they would also, in the side of a hump, make a tiny little incision, um, which would maybe cause a tiny, tiny little trickle of blood to come down, so people could also see it from that way. And then they would also put a garment, like a cloak, over the animal that would cover the whole back of the animal apart from the hump. And that was the three ways people knew that the animal was... So basically, if the animal escaped, which happens sometimes, went off and disappeared in the desert. Somebody came across this animal, they would know that this animal was, was an offering and they could take it and do it and, and do it themselves. And there were ways that if you found that animal and it was done for you, it can still count in various circumstances and so on. The best to eat the meat from that animal. No, not the person who sacrifices it usually. It's not permitted to not permitted to eat the meat of his own his own his own hadi. Um, and with camels also they do the same thing apart from the marking with blood, which is only done to camels. So cows and camels were marked with garlands around their necks. Sheep were just left as they were. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so it wouldn't be so easy if a sheep escaped to know that it was a hadi or not. But anyway, those, that, that's, the, that's the other type of sacrifice. So there's what's called nusuk, which is part of the fidya, which is a sacrifice of an animal as part of, part of fidya. Then there's jaza, which is when an animal is sacrificed in exchange for a game animal that you've killed illicitly when you're in Ihram or in the Haram. And then there is Hadi. And then the other one, which is called Udhiyya, which has not related to the Hajj, but it's the same time as the Hajj. It's related to those who haven't got on Hajj, and they do a sacrifice on the day of Eid. So those are the different types of sacrifice. It's also forbidden while you're in the Haram to cut down trees and plants for no, you know, if there is no real reason for doing it, partly, because obviously the people of Mecca would grow things there and eat things there. They are exempt. But generally, people who come there should not be attacking. And this applies in Medina as well. You shouldn't harm the trees of Medina or the trees of Mecca or the plants therein. There's also a haram in Medina, by the way. 
Right, so this basically ends the section on badges. Is there any questions? Okay, good. So um, then, then he mentions Umrah. He goes into Umrah quickly. He says, وَسُنَّةُ الْعُمْرَةِ فَفْعَلْهَا كَمَا حَجَّةِ وَفِنْ تَنْعِيمِ نَدْبًا أَحْرِمًا So he now talks about Umrah. So basically what he's talking about here now, the, why he mentions Umrah after Hajj, because he's basically going through the section of Hajj of a step-by-step -step how you do Hajj. He prefers people to do Ifrad because that was Imam Malik's preferred thing. You just go to Mecca purely with the intention of doing Hajj and nothing else. But once the days of Hajj are finished, you have finished doing all of your stoning for the two extra days or the three extra days of stoning, and it's all done. And you have done your, your Tawaf al and everything else. So the Hajj is done. And then you still have time, so you're going back to Mecca. It's recommended now, once the Hajj is done and you go back to Mecca, that you do an Umrah, if you haven't done an Umrah already, while you're there. So that's why he mentions it here. So he says here, when you do this Umrah, and it's a Sunnah, once in your lifetime, recommended to do it once a year if you can. Imam, Imam Malik disliked for it to be done more than once a year. But it's recommended to do Umrah um, once a year if you can, if you have the means. <laughs> and it's a strong Sunnah to do it once in your lifetime. Um, so he says here, do as you did for the Hajj. Do it in the same way, exactly what you did for the Hajj. Do do for the Umrah. Mm -hmm. Apart from apart from the additional things, he may, he means in terms of the Tawaf and the Sa'i. Stoning. No, 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 just the Tawaf and the Sa'i. So he says here. Um, so he says what Tanim Nadban Ahrima. So what you should do is to leave the Haram once you finished your Hajj and then enter into your Ihram outside of the Haram. The edge of the Haram, the closest one to the Kaaba is Tan'im, which is about four and a half miles away. You go there, you make your intention of Ihram for Umrah, and you do all of the process that you do for Hajj in terms of entering Ihram. The, the ghusl that you do for Ihram, the two rakats and so on and so forth, and the, the labbaiks when you're coming and all that sort of thing. Same as Hajj. We described all of this a while ago. Um, Nadban Ahrima, so you do your Ihram in the same way that you would do it for Hajj, same type of Ihram, but your intention now is purely for Umrah. Then he says, what Ithra Sa'ika, so then, uh, then you do your Tawaf in the same way that you do it for Hajj. You do counterclockwise, starting at the Black Stone, seven circuits, you know, kissing the Black Stone if you can, making sure you go outside the Hijr of Ismail, making sure that you touch the Yemeni corner if you can, and then finish at the black stone and sort of, and then after you've completed the seven circuits, you go to the Maqam Ibrahim behind it, i.e. not in front of it between the Kaaba and the Maqam Ibrahim, but behind it, do your two rakats, then go and finish by kissing the black stone if you can, then let go to the Sa'i, where you go to Safa, you do your dua on Safa, then you go to Marwa and backwards and forwards in the same way that you do for Hajj, standing on both four times each. So you finish on Marwa. So you've gone backwards and forwards seven times, in other words. And once you've done that, for Hajj, you would only be part of the way there. But for Umrah, that's it. Your Umrah is now done. So he says here, Wa ithra sa'ika, after your sa'i between Safi, Safa and Marwa, ihliqanna wa qasira. Shave your head or shorten your hair. Tahillu minha. By that you leave ihram from your umrah. Now there's one thing I want to make clear here, that this is something that I've actually noticed that a lot of people don't know. But in the madhab of Malik, if you decide to not shave your head, but merely to shorten your hair, it's not just shortening a tiny section. You can't get away with like getting your forelock and cutting a bit off your forelock. Imam Malik's position on Qasr was you have to shorten every hair on your head. This applies to men and women. It's easier for women with long hair, just gather all your hair in like that and then just cut it a little bit. But for men, if you've got short hair, you can't do that. So you actually have to make sure that you cut from every hair. Otherwise, it's, not consider it's considered that you haven't shortened your hair properly. 
It's very similar to the wiping of the head in wudu for Malik. For Malik. He understood it to mean wiping the whole head. I think I'm not sure of the Shafi position, but I think they also hold the position that you can cut, you can get away with cutting a little bit on this as well. But for Malik, it's the whole head. You have to cut from every hair, otherwise you haven't shortened. You can cut half a millimeter from every hair, but it has to be cutting from every hair. Same for Hajj as for Umrah here. Um, he says, after you've left it, tawafu kathira. Then you're still there. You've done your Umrah. You don't go and do Umrah again now. So you do one Umrah. So what do you do if, you're in, in, if you remain in Mecca for a long period of time, maybe a few more days or even a week after you finish this Umrah after the Hajj? What do you do? He says, do lots of tawafs. Basically, the tawaf is the way of greeting the mosque. And every time we come to our mosque here every day, <laughs> we, we greet it by doing two rakats when we come in. Same here, same there. Every time you go, try and do tawaf. Obviously, it's not so easy now because they actually um, have made new rulings that people have to be in their ihram clothing when they are doing tawaf. That's obviously when they're on the bottom. They're, I think they allow people to go on the top in normal clothes. So if you want to do it, you have to somehow <laughs> make sure you put on that uh, garment that you were in ihram, even though you might not be in ihram anymore, in order to do it, if you want to do it regularly. Anyway, it's recommended to do it as much as possible. It says here, وَتَوَافُ كَثِرَا مَا دُمْتَ فِي مَكَّةِ So long as you remain in Mecca, that's what you should be doing. وَرْعَ الْحُرْمَ حَرِّمَ And be very careful of, uh, of be, that you are in the haram here. Make sure to take into account where you are. You are in the presence of the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the main house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. So be, make sure that your actions are appropriate when you're, when you're there. You know, just be, be reverent. It's very important but well, the whole time you're there. It's not, it's not actually difficult. <laughs> Every time you go to the Kaaba, you're struck by awe. If you ever, if you ever manage to go on Hajj, you'll see that. It's, it's basically surrounded by an atmosphere of Heba, which is sort of like, make, makes, you on your, make, make, makes you deeply aware of where you are. It's actually quite difficult <laughs> when you feel that to, to knowingly do anything wrong. <laughs> it's the opposite. Of, well, Medina is also a different, in a different way. When, you are, when you're in Medina, it also has a, a very strong feeling there, but it's a, it's a feeling of, of love and of peace when you're, when, you, when you're in Medina, which is one of the reasons I say that if you are going to go on Hajj, try and find a package that allows you to do Medina after. Mecca. If you go to, okay, also that was, the, that was the way that it was, was done by the companions and that's the way the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu described it in the Hadith when he talked about Thumma going to Mecca after, going to Medina afterwards. But if you go from absolute peace to being completely in awe and fear, or, you know, it's a very, it's a big sort of shock. Whereas if you have a come down from, from that sort of awe of Mecca in Medina, where you can all sit, where you can settle and be fully at peace, then it's 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 a much better way than of of completing the completing the the actions and going home after that, much easier. Wara al hurima lijani bil bait. While while you are in the proximity of the house, make sure that you realize that hurma, that sort of special nature of where you are the entire time. And re remember the things that are prohibited while you are in the haram and make sure you don't do them, even if you might not be in a state of ihram yourself. Wazid fil khidma, and then do as much khidma, as much service as you can. Service can, be, can mean acts of ibadah to Allah, service to Allah, but also service of other people. Be as generous as you can be. If people are in need of help, go out of your way to help them and all these types of things. You are in a place where... where, where where all of these actions, good actions, are magnified to a, to a huge degree. I mean, uh, the prayer is a worth a hundred thousand times, but some people say well, it's worth el elsewhere and so on and so forth. Every good action that you do there, you are stocking up. So make sure you do anything that is pleasing in the eyes of Allah and help those who, who need help as much as you can. So this means, for example, feeding people. And you'll find that lots of people often, especially in the mosques of the, of, of the Prophet and there, go out of their way to feed people. 
have circles of knowledge, as long as you're not distracting people from their tawaf. Find places where you can where you can teach or where you can learn and so on and so forth. Read lots of Quran, all those types of things. And if you can, pray all your prayers in the in the mosque. Inshallah. Um, then he says here, Walazim Safa. So keep in the Saf, keep in the the, the lines of prayer around around the Kaaba. فَإِنْ عَزِمْتَ عَلَى الْخُرُوجِ And then when you make your decision to leave, when you resolve on going on your way, when the time has come where, 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 where your package in Mecca is coming to an end and your driver or guide says, look, now we, we, the bus is leaving or whatever. And I was interested to find out in the Mudawana, they, they have words that basically would be the same as a bus driver or a tour operator now. Mm. The word kari is the, is the person that people would hire to to take them to the to Mecca. And it talks about when you when you want to leave, um you have to take into account when your Kari wants to leave. <laughs> so they they had they had, they had these things well, even back in the time of Imam Malik where you where you had like tour operators and things like that. So basically when they when they want to leave and your time is up, then he says, what do you do then? He says, Tuf Kama Alimt, do your tawaf of wada or tawaf of sadr as it's called, your tawaf of leaving. Your tawaf of goodbye. So basically, part of the adab towards the house of Allah is to not leave it without saying goodbye. And you do this by saying tawaf. And then you go on your way. Where do you go from there? He says, Wasir li qabril mustafa, and go from there to the qabr, to the grave of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's very interesting that he puts it this way. He says here, وَسِرْ لِقَبْرِ الْمُصْطَفَى بِأَدَبٍ وَنِيَّةٍ He doesn't say go to Medina. He doesn't say go to the mosque of Medina. He says go to the grave of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi And when you see the people of Allah talk about this, or the people of knowledge, they talk about going to Medina as either going to the grave of the Messenger of Allah or going to see the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi They never talk about it as simply going to the city. Your entire purpose of going to Medina is to visit the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just as your entire purpose of going to Mecca is to visit the house of Allah. That is why you are there, to do your pilgrimage. Going to Medina, your purpose is visiting the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You should not have any other purpose for this particular visit if you want to get the most from it. And as a result, they say that when you come to the outskirts of Medina, just like when you go into the into your state of Ihram when you're going to Mecca, you do the Talbiya. When you come to the outskirts of Medina and you see the trees and the, uh, the, the, the palm trees that represent the outskirts of it, then you start doing Salawat on the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the moment you step inside the city, you greet the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because it's his city. So that's the first thing. You greet him and then you continue. You, um, the moment you step inside, then you go and you clean yourself up properly. You've been traveling, so you want to put on your now you put on your best clothes, put on your best perfume, clean yourself, get into a pure state of purification. Then you go to the mosque of the Messenger of Allah. Mm -hmm. The moment you step inside the mosque, again, you greet the Rasul. That's the second greeting now. Then you don't just stop in the mosque the first place that you get to, you go to the Rawdah. Now that's not so easy now, because you basically have to wait your turn in sort of like they have it because because so many people are coming but um if you find that you have to do that then obviously you can do some rakas of greeting the mosque before going into the rolda but the best thing is to go straight to the rolda and do two rakats within the rolda of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is the area between the mimbar and the qabr of the rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is considered to be one of the as the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi said one of the the meadows of the garden you do two rakats of greeting the, the, the mosque, and then you go straight to the qabr of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you greet him for the third time. And then you this, by the way, this is one of the places, as he mentions here, to jab li kulli matlabi. When you do this, every desire or request that you have is granted. Well, this is a place where the du'as are heard and responded to. So. 
this visit to Medina, especially when you come to the grave of the Messenger of Allah, is a place where you should do plenty of du'a. But you start by greeting the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then by greeting Sayyidina Abu Bakr, who is just to the right, you go maybe half a yard to the right, and the adab of greeting the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to stand and face him where his, where his head would be, and then to greet him. Um, and then you move slightly to the right, you greet Sayyidina Abu Bakr, slightly further to the right, and you greet Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. So this is, this is the adab of what you do. When you're there, your focus the entire time you'll be there should be the greeting of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you greet him as if he was alive. All the adab that you would have for somebody, and we know that the Anbiya are alive in their graves anyway, the Anbiya. The Anbiya. So you, you greet him, and you don't raise your voice. If there's a story of Imam Malik alayhi salam, uh, an, where um, Imam Malik was was with one of the uh, was with the Khalifa of the Muslims, Abu Ja'far, and they he was this man was having an argument with somebody. So Imam Malik sort of told him that this is not a place. He said, "Do not raise your voice over the voice of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam." And he gave him some advice. And um, said the, the 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 people who are the, who who get the most from this are those who lower their voices in the company of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he's mentioning the ayats that refer to this in the beginning of Surah Al Hujurat. Um, and when he heard this, he was very chastened by it. And so then he started to ask Imam Malik exactly how he should be when he was visiting the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And Imam Malik told him, "You go and stand in front of the Rasul. You face him throughout the time you are there." You make dua while you are there, and you also ask him directly for shafa. Ah. So this is one of the things that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can grant us. That Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given him the capacity of granting us, and it can be asked for yeah. by us of him, which is shafa, ah, which is his intercession on our behalf on the last day. So he says here, um, Salim alayhi, say your, say your greetings to him, thumma zid, then, then add to this, li siddiq, for the siddiq Abu Bakr, the greetings to him, wa thumma ila Umar, then greet Umar, nil to tawfiq, and by doing this you have, you have um, got um, success, you have achieved success. وَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ ذَا الْمَقَامْ يُسْتَجَابُ Know that this particular place is one where du'as are answered. يُسْتَجَابُ فِيهِ الدُّعَاء Du'as are answered for it. فَلَا تَمِلَّهِ Do not be bored. Do not stop. مِنْ طُلَابِ from, from asking. Just be constant. Ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never be bored of you asking Him. Do not yourselves find it difficult to continue. Just keep on doing it. Again, even asking the same thing again and again and again. Just keep on asking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's answers, du'as are, the du'as are answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that particular place. Wasal shafa'ata, and ask for shafa'a, ask for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa for shafa'a. Wa khatman hasina, and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a husnul khatima, for the best of seals to your life, that you go to him as a mu'min and as a Muslim. And that the acts that you are upon, upon there will be the same sort of acts that you will still be upon when you go to see him. Then once you've done, when, the, when you are now spending your time in Medina, there are a few other things to do. Go to visit the other Sahaba, if you can, in, in the Qabr of Baqir. Go to Uhud to visit the Shuhada of Uhud. And there's a number of other places you want to go where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam loved to go. So try and follow the places where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had. Or if you're gonna, if you if it's going to be something that brings you closer to Allah and is a service that's a good reminder, go to the places that are important in the history of Islam in that particular place. So make use of your time. But the best use of your time while you are in Medina that you should concentrate on is visiting the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Try and pray as many prayers as you can in the rawda of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Try and spend time with the Rasul, visiting him as many times as you can while you are, especially as, as somebody who is from outside of Medina. 
Those who are within Medina, that's not so strongly suggested of them, although there are certain people who need that. <laughs> Depends on the people. But especially if you come from outside, try and spend as much time. There's nothing sweeter than that time that you spend in the company of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Make use of every moment that you can while you are in Medina. It says here, now you finished. You're going home. He says, Wa'ajil awbata. Make sure you rush or you hurry home when you're on your return journey. So once you finish the Hajj, do not make your Hajj and your trip to Medina just sort of like part of a multi-city visit that you are doing. Don't just say, okay, now this is stage one. All right, now I'm going to go to such and such a place and such and such a place and so on and so forth. I mean, I know a lot of people have as packages, for example, going to Quds afterwards. But I don't suggest that people should do that. If they are going to go to Quds, maybe they should do it beforehand. Um, because the recommendation is that once, basically to keep your intention pure and to keep your intention strong. This applies to many things. For example, if you are going to a, 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 a night of dhikr, for example, somewhere, um, you shouldn't sort of fit in the night of dhikr around other activities that you've got planned. That should be your sole focus. Then once it's done, okay, you can think about other things after that. But your focus when you are doing this most important journey in your life, the Hajj, should be for the Hajj. And then because of the connection to the Hajj of visiting the Rasul, you can attach Medina to that, but that should be it. You shouldn't be making it part of a, of, a, of a sort of tourist of a tourist sort of thing or whatever else it might be, or then throwing in that as a trading journey that you're going to do afterwards or whatever it is. Try and put all your focus on that journey. And then when you finished it, go home. When you have done what you came to do, you've, you've, your, your, your muna, your desire in coming has been met. When you go home, he says here, Wadhul Dohan. You've got to realize that when people traveled home in the past, this was months that it took them to get home very often. Um, so you could choose the time of day that you would arrive. So arriving at night can be a bit startling for the people that you, you come to, even arriving late in the day when they've had a full day. So the best time to come was in the morning when everybody's fresh and the most joyous part of the day. So they was recommended that the people, when they came back from Hajj, would come back into their place where they lived in the sort of early to mid morning period. Um, and when you arrive, and bring with you presents to bring joy. We do this for, I mean, it's part of, part of the sunnah almost of travel in general, but especially when you've been on a journey of this nature. I mean, uh, they, they will not have seen you maybe for months. <laughs> So, you know, it's part of rekindling that sort of love in their hearts and reconnecting that you bring presence. And so that's an affirm sunnah. Washab hadiyata sururi ila al-aqarib to your relatives, especially your close relatives, your children, your wife, your parents, whoever else. Waman bika yaduru, and those who gravitate around you, those who are part of your circle. And in addition to this, we can we can add those who come to visit you when you arrive back. So try and maybe when you come back, you bring people do now lots of zamzam, lots of dates, whatever it is. I mean, it's a joyous occasion for everybody when somebody comes back from Hajj. And also it, it gives people other than you the himma to make that journey themselves. So it's a, quite an important that the return in some ways is a lot more important than people realize how people come back from the Hajj. So this is the the end of this section. Is there any questions before we go on to the Kitab Mabadi' Tasawwuf, which is, I mean, we're not going to have time to do much of that. Aren't we? Any questions online about any of this? Just not. So we'll just touch on a little bit on the next one because uh, I don't want to do it too too long. So um, We'll just do a quick touching at the beginning of the next section. Kitabu Mabadi Tasawwuf or Hawadi Ta'aruf. The book of the, the building blocks, the basics, the starting points of Tasawwuf, the things from which Tasawwuf start. Some people translate Mabadi as principles, but they're not necessarily a very good translation. And Mabda is the place from which something starts. Or um, Hawadi, the things that bring guidance 
to ta'aruf, to having knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Irfan. Um, in a sense, the mabda, he mentions a few things here, the, the starting points of tasawuf, but in fact, they've already started in this book. Because you cannot have tasawuf without Islam and Iman. It is not sort of uh, purely some sort of thing that you, you know, you have all of these Sufi groups of the modern world who seem to think that you can do it without being a Muslim, <laughs> for example, non Muslim Sufis and things like that. Basically, it is the science of Ihsan. And in order for something to be done well, it has to be already being done. Because Ihsan basically translates as doing something well. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously mentions in the hadith that it is worshipping Allah as if you see him, and if you do not see him, know that he sees you. But the word itself, Ihsan, which is generally accepted as being the science of tasawwuf, means doing something well, which means that you're already doing it. So you have to have the building block in place of being a Muslim and doing these things already at some level. Having Iman in Allah and His Messenger at some level. And then Ihsan is increasing your level of that until it becomes a certainty. Even though Iman is already a form of certainty, it becomes, a, it becomes an experienced certainty where you can almost see it and taste it, which is greater than sim simply a, a mental certainty. So basically, in order for that to be to sow off, you have to have Islam and Iman in place. That's the first, the first thing. Also, it is not an optional extra to sow off. To sow off is not something that you can just put like a cherry on the cake. That the cake is fine without the cherry, and the cherry just makes it a bit better. No. He includes this section in a book which is called Al Murshid Al Mu'in Fi Daruri Min Ulum Al Din, the the helpful guide for matters which are daruri, which are necessary, matters of the deen, sciences of the deen, which are necessary for people to have. This is a necessity, and in fact, if you think about it, purifying yourself of inward wrong actions is a necessity because we are told to keep away from wrong actions. And these wrong actions, they, you can only really purify yourself of them if you have somebody who is like a doctor who can prescribe you a cure for that particular thing. It's not always easy to do, to rid yourself of most of these things on your own. Most of the things of the deen, they, 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 have, they, they have people of knowledge who can show you how to do them. Um, and the sciences of the inward are even more because they're harder to remove. <laughs> so you need like a tib, tabib a doctor of the heart. And so basically one of the things he mentions later in this section is that you cannot do this, this science of Tasawwuf. The, the Mabadi, the basics that you put in place, yes, can be done without it, without it. But you need a sheikh in order to progress along this particular path to get to, to, the, to the levels where you have removed these things and purified yourself and replaced them with qualities that are superior requires somebody who can look at you you can sit with them, they can diagnose what is actually wrong with you and then prescribe you a cure. I mean, that's the, book, that's, that, that, that's the way most medicine works. And this is a form of the medicine of the heart. So ridding ourselves of these qualities, things like kibr, for example, there's, there's a, there's, they are a hadith that mentions that you can't, enter, you can't enter the garden if you have kibr, which is like pride of a, of a certain type, thinking yourself superior to others. Yeah. You can't enter the garden if you have this in your heart. How do you rid yourself of it then? That's where you, where people like Imam al-Ghazali said that to sell off is there now an obligation because ridding yourself of such things is an obligation on the, on, on, on the human being. And um, we know that these things must, we, we, we have to guard against the heart because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in sam'a wal basara wal fu'ada kullu ula'ika kana anhu mas'ula. The sama, what we hear, the basar, what we see, and the fu'ad, the things that we have in the heart, the, the, the feelings of the heart or the, or the actions of the heart, things like, you know, you know, greed or the opposite or generosity or whatever, when they are purely internal. The human being is asked about them. In other words, we are taken to task for those things. So it's important that we are aware of them and we do something about them. 
So there are some things that we can do even before we take a sheikh, and he mentions some of these things, and these are the basic building blocks, the mabadi. And the first he says is, وَتَوْبَةٌ مِنْ كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ يُجْتَرَمْ Tawbah. Tawbah is translated as, not regret, um, repentance. Repentance from every wrong action that is done is an obligation. Tajibu fawran, immediately that you do the wrong action, mutlaqan, whatever type of wrong it is, an absolute sense. And what is tawbah? And he basically now explains what he means by this. So the starting point, which everybody can do, even when you don't have a sheikh, and every human being makes wrong actions. If you think that you're not going to make wrong actions ever in your life, you're, you're sadly mistaken. I mean, there's a famous hadith that Kullu bani Adam khatta, every, every one of the, the, the Banu Adam, every human being is khatta'un, they are people who do mistakes. And the best of the people who make mistakes are the tawwabun, the people who do tawbah whenever they do them. So we're all going to make mistakes. So we all need to know about tawbah, which is um, acknowledging the, 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 the thing that we've done is wrong, just repenting from it, in other words, feeling that, knowing that it is wrong and having regret, nadam, about doing it. But before we start here, I'd like to say that there's a difference between guilt and regret. Guilt is not part of this deen. Guilt is knowing something is wrong and then holding on to it and beating yourself up about it. Basically, you, you, you hold on to the thing and you, you sort of punish yourself internally because of that wrong action. That is not what the Muslim does. The Muslim knows that he's wrong, he has regret, and he turns to Allah, and then he has a high expectation of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive him. He doesn't, do, he doesn't ask for Allah's forgive, forgiveness and think, oh no, Allah's not going to forgive me. He does it in the hope and expectation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. So he, he did the wrong action, and then once he has made tawbah, he lets it go. He removes that thing from him from himself. He doesn't hold on to it. He certainly doesn't tell other people about it, which is mujahara bin, which is which is actually making a wrong action worse because it might be in some ways encouraging others to doing it, especially when people boast about wrong actions that they've done. But he doesn't hold on to it. So this whole thing of, of guilt, which I think is a quite a Christian concept in some ways, but in Islam it, it doesn't really have a place. Regret is not the same as guilt. So this is nadam. Bishart al iqla. So the, one of the conditions of tawbah is stopping the wrong action that you're doing. So, for example, if you're drinking, um, you know, a glass of whiskey, and then you have a couple of sips, and you say, stuff oh, Allah, I shouldn't be doing this. And then you continue to drink it anyway, but you, 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 you're, you're sort of regretting it while you're doing it, but you're not stopping. That's not tawbah. You're just continuing to do something and that regret is a sort of like a fake regret, or it's not really a strong form of regret. It's more like a guilt, in a sense, <laughs> in that particular case, because um, you haven't really regretted it enough to stop it. So it's not really iqla, it's, you're not fulfilling the condition of tawbah. nafyul um, israri, and making the uh, intention to not do it again, or to not continue to doing it. So if you, if you drink your thing of whiskey and put it down, supper, I wish I hadn't done, I'm not going to do that. Or if you're if you're having a relationship with a girl and you you sleep with her, and then um after you finish, you, you feel regret and you say, oh, I'm not gonna do it. But then internally you're making the intention to go back the next night. Again, that's not that's not Tauba. <laughs> Even if you've regretted what you're doing, it's not Tauba because you're still you're making an intention to go back to it while you're making this. <laughs> It doesn't mean that, for example, somebody who sincerely regrets doing it and makes Tawbah, but then they're weak and the next day they go and do the same thing again, but they hadn't been intending to. That's different. If somebody, though, while they're making Tawbah, is still making the intention of doing it again, that's not Tawbah. Um, and you should also, on top of this, so you stop doing the act. One thing he hasn't mentioned, you, part of it is asking Allah's forgiveness. So you have to say astaghfirullah and mean astaghfirullah. That you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
to wipe out that wrong action from you because only he can do it. You can't wipe it out from yourself. You can't, you can't assume Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. You have to ask him and then have a high opinion of him, but you have to ask him. Istighfar is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for ghufran, for forgiveness. The final part, apart from having nadam, regret, asking Allah for forgiveness, stopping doing the wrong action and making intention to not go back to do it again, is if the thing you have done has harmed people and not just been something that you shouldn't do in the eyes of Allah. So, for example, you've stolen somebody's car, let's say. You can't just steal their car and then keep their car and make and you regret the action. You have to make things right with the person that you took the thing from. So, for example, in this case, stealing the car, you would have to return the car to that person. Or if you've damaged it, you have to pay him for the damage or whatever it is. You have to make things right if it's possible to make things right with that particular thing. Or for example, if you hit somebody and damage them, part of your making right with them is paying the blood money and so on. So there's various different things that apply in terms of the tawbah. Because if you make tawbah to Allah, but don't make things right with the other people, then on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, when you come, your right actions can now be taken from that person because you didn't pay them back in this, this world. Even if you made things right with Allah, Still not enough. You have to make things right with people. That's the final aspect of Tawbah. And we'll just finish with the next one here. The other most important thing is Taqwa. And um, Taqwa has its place in terms of action and then its place in terms of what the actions result in terms of the heart. So it's often translated as fearful awareness of Allah. Um, but... It, it implies more than simply an, in, an inward dimension to it. Taqwa is actually an action, protecting yourself. It comes from the word wiqaya, which is like protection, which is stopping something happening to you, like a shield, shielding yourself. So he says here, Ibn, Ibn Ashir, وَحَاسِلُ taqwa, the um, upshot of taqwa, what, what results from taqwa, or what taqwa results from, is ishtinabun wamtithal. Ishtinab means avoidance of wrong action. And this is put first because avoidance from, from wrong action is considered to be the harder of the two. Um, everybody does actions which are correct every now and again, but it's very difficult to avoid doing wrong actions. Um, as I said, we were, we were all almost, you know, it's part of our being to, to do things that are, that are wrong occasionally. So to avoid that is... is Consciously is, is not always an easy thing for the human being. But this is something that is easy, as I said, it is before to sow of. This is something that you have to be doing if you want to take the path of self. You have to be somebody who's already conscious, somebody who already knows what's right and wrong. In order to have tawbah and taqwa, well, part of that is do you have knowledge? How do you know what's right and wrong? <laughs> Unless you have knowledge of these things. So there's a few basics that we can see here. First, that you have knowledge of the basics of the deen that you are engaged upon. Second, that if you do things wrong, you make them right by turning back to Allah. And thirdly, um, avoiding those things that are wrong as much as you can. And imtithal, and doing as many of the things that are right that you can. So there's some things, obviously, that are the basics, the pillars, the, the pillars of this deen, but trying to go beyond that to do things that are liked not just the things that are obligatory on you and so on and so forth. But obviously that starts with doing what is obligatory on you, just as avoidance starts with avoiding what is prohibited of you. Once you are able to do that, then you can move to the next stage. But for example, there is little, I mean, there, there will still be some benefit, but there's not much benefit if you are just going to pray in the night and not do any of the five prayers. You start with the, the, with the obligation and you build on what is obligatory. That, that's the, so basically, in terms of this thing, you start with the obligatory, then you add the nawafil, and then you add the next stage of tasawwuf on, on, on top of that. So that's basically the building block in terms of action. Any, anybody who wants to be on the path of tasawwuf has to be doing as much of the oblig obligations of the deen as they can. And on top of that, you build the next layer of things that are sunnah, then the next layer of things that this is why he's gone through all of these different stages. The next level of things that are recommended. The next level of things that are better to do than other things. 
which they're not necessarily recommended, but if there's two choices, you choose the better one and so on. Then you add to that the avoidance of the things that you shouldn't be doing. And then you gradually get into a position where, you, where, where, where this path, you're in a position to properly follow this path, to, uh, to, to achieve those levels of ihsan, of excellence, of worshipping Allah, as if you are actually seeing him in everything that you do, everything that you know, you know it's exactly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But these basics must be in place first. So he says, In your inward and your outward. So obviously it's sometimes easier to avoid things in the outward. But if you, for example, start uh, finding yourself in the mosque, you know, looking around, wanting, wanting to make sure people can see you when you pray. I mean, there's a wonderful story that's, that's, that's mentioned here. Is one of the ulama was, used to come to the mosque every day. And he'd always, for 40 years, pray in the front row, without exception. Then one day he arrived, and he missed it. He was late. And he had to pray in the back row. And he felt ashamed that he was praying in the back row at some level of his being. So then he re-prayed all of those 40 years of prayers because he thought, well, maybe I was doing it just so people could see that I was in the front row. <laughs> if I feel shame that I'm not in the front row, then maybe I was doing it for just people. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the, that, that's the level of internal wrong action that they tried to avoid, some, some, some of these people of Allah. That little hint of shame that he felt because he wasn't where he normally prayed made him re-examine everything that he'd done in the terms of the prayer up to that point. He says, by doing ijtinab and imtithal fi zahir wa batin in the inward and the outward, be there with that tunal, taqwa is acquired. So here he's talking about the actions that are, that are part of taqwa, which is the, doing these things and avoiding these things, mainly avoiding these things. By that, that fearful awareness where you are conscious that you are being observed, because that's basically what taqwa is, you're conscious that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is observing you in your action, becomes part of who you are. So you can achieve a certain amount of that level by being sincere in avoiding and sincere in doing. And then your level of taqwa increases and the ranks of the muttaqeen are endless. But, uh, you know, it's, it's basically when you can't do, you can't do any of this if you, unless you have some fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and awareness of he is, he is watching you. As we said, Ihsan is And to worship Allah as if you see him, because if you don't see him, know that he sees you. So that's, that's taqwa, <laughs> in a sense, you know, so you can't do this without taqwa. Anyway, we'll finish there, inshallah, just touching on this, this particular thing that we were going to talk about. Is there any questions? If you've done the wrong action with the person you're close to, um, and then you separated from them, um, you have to reconnect with them again to apologize for the wrong actions you did when they well, were it, there. it depends, you see, what, what type of wrong action. For example, if you slander somebody publicly, yeah. then you have to take back that slander. If you steal from somebody, you have to give back. But you can't always hurt, you can't always mend somebody's hurt feelings. But things, that's why he says, if it's mumkin, if it's possible to make it right. Yeah, a friend of mine was in a relationship with the girl and he had contact with her that he shouldn't have had contact with her. He did it detail. But then he was doing a wrong action himself and she was doing a wrong action. She was a Muslim woman. And um, he obviously needs to make taiba. You know, and but that's not something that can that, that can be rectified. What do you? How are you going to rectify rectify that particular one? There's no payment that's made in that particular case. I see. But I mean, she she was doing something wrong, and he was doing something. Yeah. Wrong. So there's things he's that done tarba. they both need to make tarba. Yeah. Um, but he's not obliged to contact her again to rekindle the relationship. No, 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 absolutely not. That might lead to more wrong. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's the thing where both people should be making trouble of the wrong that they've done, but you're not going to be able to rectify that by any particular financial payment or returning of anything. What in the case of slander? Slander is a different issue. Right. If, you, if you impugn somebody or destroy their reputation publicly, 
yeah. then you have to basically try and repair that reputation of that person by, by publicly saying you were lying about them, by campaign to, to, to reverse everything that, that had been, mal- all the ways they'd been maligned and so on and so forth. And as much as you can. You can only do what you can. Backbiting as well, presumably, because backbiting is disclosing things that are true, but you... And that's, that, that's, that's very difficult to make right. Because it's a true thing you've talked to me. Yeah, so I mean, they, you need to, if you can, if it, it's possible to make something right, you make it right. But it's difficult to sometimes make certain types of things right with a person. I mean, usually usually, usually it's financial things or physical things like physical. blood money or or slander, which is lies that can you can you can admit that they're lies or, or false testimony. What about slander in the case of, say, political figure who's not a Muslim? I mean, slander them, trying to make a joke or something. I mean, I mean, basically, if it's not affected them, then there's nothing you can do to make it right. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you're if you're slandering somebody in a public way where where it affects them and it's a lie. Um, then you should you should strive to make it right. But there are certain ex- exceptions to this. For example, if that person poses a harm to the Muslims and you need to warn people away from that, you still shouldn't be using lying, but you could be using what might otherwise be construed as backbiting. For example, if somebody has, you know, uh, some views that are mis- taking people out of Islam because they're, 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 their 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 is completely wrong and they're getting people to believe in three gods or whatever, I don't know, but it, anything that might be, and, and they are very influential, then you can say bad things about them to, some you know, true bad things about them to, to warn people about them, even if they might not like people to hear that that they're saying these things. If you know that there's a chance that they're going to mislead that person, then you need to warn them. And also there are, in terms of testimony, if you're giving testimony and you need to, to say something, <laughs> the problem is sometimes with testimony, for example, if you're giving testimony that somebody has slept with somebody else and um, you, it's true testimony, you saw it, you can still be, uh, receive the had punishment for slander because maybe not, not, not enough people gave testimony along with you. So you do have to be careful even when it's true. So can you just confirm that the backbiting again? So if you've got, if you've got two people that have you know, viciously, you know, ravaged a third person's character behind their back. Yes. Um, what about it, in that? Yeah. So I mean, if they can try and make it right, they try and make it right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, as I said, if it, sometimes if it's true and it's just things that people didn't want to get out, it might not be so easy to make it right without lying. And you're not meant to lie. Mm-hmm. So people in, the, in that particular case would just have to ask the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and maybe if they can make it right between them personally and that person, who knows. But you know, a, lot of the, a lot of these things will be covered next time because he goes into a lot more detail on, well, he mentions these by name anyway, Ghiba and Nima, <coughs> Nima and all these other things. So we'll do that next time. Is there any questions online before I close? Okay, well, we'll finish there, inshallah. Bissiri wa barakati, bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, ar-Rahman rahim maliki yawm al-Din, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in, ihdina sirat al-Mustaqim, sirat al-Ladhina namta alayhim, ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dhalin, ameen. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin abdika wa rasulika nabiyinu mi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salim taslima, subhana rabbika rabbil izzati ya ma'isikum, wa salam ala rasulim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaykum, assalamu alaykum. See you next time, inshallah.